Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd and this is Old Yorkshire. And today we're going to be looking at a place called Castle Hill. Not the one in Cottingham, but the one out here near Swine. So if you take a walk up the old Hull and Hornsey railway track, which is now a cycle route, and you go past Sutton Station and head outwards towards Swine, you eventually come to a bridge over Holderness Drain. And Holderness Drain dates back to the times of the Abbey of Muse, when the mucks were draining the countryside in order to turn it arable so that they could have sheep grazing there to help with their wool industry. But in the 1760s, the drain was widened and almost turned into a canal, but that's a story for another time. But on the other side of that, once you get across there, you'll notice something quite uncharacteristic for this very, very flat environment. You'll notice a kind of wooded hill. That hill. And the thing about that hill is it's artificial and it's known amongst locals as Castle Hill. In fact, the farm road that leads to it is called Castle Hill Road. But was it really a castle? And if so, which castle? Well, let's have a look and see if we can find out. So up here on this artificial hill, if you look at it from the air, you'll see that it's actually a big oval shape and it's kind of sliced off in its corner by the drain. And there's a good reason for that. If you'll remember from our Skipsy Castle episode, this is a type of castle called a Mott and Bailey. So there was an artificial oval hill built and a Bailey surrounding it. The castle would have been built on top of this hill. And at some point during the 18th century, during the canalisation of Holderness Drain, that sliced into the corner of the Mott and kind of truncated it a little bit. And sadly, over the hundreds of years since its construction, it's also been robbed because it's actually built with gravel and sand. So it was a really good place for locals to mine and dig for gravel for their own purposes. So it's kind of left the whole place a little bit ragged and more like a series of hills than one particularly obvious conical hill like we had at Skipsey. But where does its history begin? One big question is, when did this site start to be inhabited? Well, we know for certain that Holderness was inhabited as early as the Middle Bronze Ages, that's 3,000 years ago. And we know that Holderness itself was inhabited in the Stone Age because of the Rudston monolith up near Bridlington. But we're not entirely certain about this particular site. But there is one compelling piece of evidence that this particular site was important during prehistory. And that is the location just across there, over to the northwest of it, of what's called a barrow. And a barrow is a kind of prehistoric burial ground. It's a round barrow that dates back to, at the very least, the Iron Ages. And that means that this place was on the map, even for the Celts. Now going forward to the Roman occupation of Britain, one historian, Thomas Thompson, suggests that this site may have been the location of a Roman fort. Not a big one, like the one at Derventio in Malton, but a small way station, just Effectively, a place where a small garrison of troops would be stationed in order to discourage banditry from the locals. And why would they put one of those here? Well, in the Roman times, the village of Swine was well known for its pig farming and was reasonably wealthy. There have been plenty of coin halls from the Roman age actually dug up by archaeologists around there. So, this would have been on the route between Swine and places like the Roman settlements at Bruff 
and Ticton, which made it an important route, especially if they were moving valuable produce like pork, because the says something about the Romans, they knew how to eat, they loved their pork and their fish. This would have been quite well defended. And these Roman way stations were not exactly rare. They were actually fairly common along most roads and most trade routes. So we're not entirely sure whether there was a Roman fort here, but it's probably worth pointing out that the Normans do have track records of taking older earthwork fortifications from the Iron Age and from the Romans and building castles on them. We saw in the Skipsy castle episode that Drogo may well have chosen Skipsy to centre his Lordship of Holderness on because it had a huge conical mound of earth already present there from the Bronze Age. So it's not outside the realms of possibility that whoever settled here took one look at an earthwork ditch that may have been created by the Romans, for example, and thought, that's a great place for a defensive site. It's entirely possible. But who would have built that? Well, we know after the Norman invasion that this land was held of swine, the manor of swine, which was held in turn by the Archbishop of York. And the person responsible here for holding this for the Archbishop was a man called John Sayer. Now, all that tells us is who owned the land. Uh, we, we don't really know anything about the castle. What we do know is when it passed from the custodianship of the Manor of Swine to the Manor of Sutton, the Lords of Sutton certainly did something here. Now I suspect that the original castle here may have just been a timber one, and that was a common thing when you built small Mott and Bailey castles. They just kept the wooden castle for a while, and if it was needed, it was upgraded to stone. If it wasn't, then it just fell into ruin and fell apart. Now, what I think happened here is that in the 14th century, Sir John de Sutton actually decided to replace the wooden castle with stone, possibly as a status symbol. It certainly wouldn't have been particularly effective as a, as a fortification in the 14th century. Medieval castle siege technology had by far outstripped Mott and Bailey castles at that point. If you want to see the bleeding edge of castle design, check out Edward I's 13th century castles in Wales. They are astonishing. They're full of concentric ring designs, curtain towers with drum towers surrounding them, gatehouses that were killing fields for anybody trying to get inside them. That was far and away what was considered to be a defensible structure, even by the 13th century. And in the 14th century, a little tower on a hill was Nobody was worried about that. So it must have been a status symbol. But we have a record that in uh, the 14th century, Sir John de Sutton was fined by the crown for crenellating a building here. And crenellation is the act of fortifying a medieval manor house or a tower. And crenellations themselves are the little bibbly bits that go up and down across the tops of castles. They're the bits that allow you to basically turn it into a defensive structure places where soldiers can hide behind whilst they're reloading their, uh, their crossbows. It's a place where people can sort of tip boiling water on attackers or places where people can stand to taunt the attackers and say that their mothers smell of elderberries. And when Sir John was fined for this, I suspect that that was the point where he was upgrading it to a stone castle. But the only other mention we have of their castle is that it, when he died in the 1360s, it passed to his wife, Alicia. And that's it. That is the last we hear of Bransholm Castle in history. It is literally just those two mentions. The mention of being fined for crenellating the building and the mention of it passing to Alicia on his death. And that is kind of weird, but also really important because this castle wasn't an important place. It was, if you consider in the Middle Ages, people have always wanted to show off their status. Back in the Middle Ages, there weren't many ways in which you could kind of show off your wealth to those around you. It's not like in those days that you could buy a car, but let's use that as an analogy here. Kings had multiple castles. They were the equivalent of the guy who's got a garage with a Bugatti Veyron and a Lamborghini and a Ferrari and maybe a couple of Bentleys for going down to the shops in. The earls and the lords and the counts of the huge territories, places like 
Harry Percy of Northumbria reigning from Annick Castle and Bamber Castle, or the Earl of Warwick reigning from Warwick Castle. These were the kind of guys who had maybe a Bentley and a Ferrari just to show off in, and maybe an Aston Martin in the garage. But little rural castles like this, they were Range Rovers. They were just that way for the local lord to cement his position as being just that bit above everybody else. All these upstart merchants, no, 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 no. You don't have a castle. I have a castle. I'm best. Don't forget it. And that's an important part of our history, just that whole pecking order thing, that castles represented a, a, a certain nobility and a certain inherent power that the lords possessed over everybody else. So after the castle passes into the hands of Alicia, we really have no more record of Branzome Castle. It just falls back into the obscurity of history from which it came. The only thing left is a big hill. But we do know for certain that there was a building here sometime in the Tudor period, sometime built in the 15th and 16th centuries, because it's referenced as a hall uh, in various local legal texts. We also know that the corner of a potentially Tudor building was uncovered during the digging of a trench by soldiers in 1918 as they were building a practice trench here. So it certainly was still inhabited and it would certainly have been uh, a place where lords would have lived, or at least the wealthier people would have lived. Another piece of evidence for the Elizabethan manor comes from the name of this hill before it was called Castle Hill again, when it was known as Mansion House in the 18th century. So what we're left with here in the 21st century is a mutilated mot, a mound that's been hacked to pieces by gravel diggers and by World War I soldiers who hacked a trench across it. And still we can see the shape of it. We can still see that oval nature of the original Mott Hill. We can still see the moat and the ditch and the bank that would have surrounded it. It's covered in trees and it's drenched in mystery because we don't know much about it. I mean, Branzome Castle appears maybe half a dozen times in the historical records. We've never any mention of where it actually is. Because I just want to make the point that I'm not 100% sure, as nobody is, that this site here is actually Bransholm Castle. But on the balance of probabilities that this was Bransholm in the Ordnance Survey maps of 1850, and that Bransholm Castle would have been an actual Mott Castle and there are no other sites with evidence of Mott and Bailey earthworks in the region, it kind of makes sense that this, as I say on the balance of probabilities, is likely to be Bransholm Castle. But that mystery alone makes it exciting because when I used to live on Long Hill as a kid, I used to walk up this way quite a lot along the drain. And uh, when I reached this area, one of the things that always fascinated me was that mystery, that, oh, what is that? You'd look on maps of Hull and see, oh, Castle Hill Road, so that's, that's, that must be Castle Hill. I don't think there was a castle here. Surely there wasn't a castle here. And frankly, I've spent the intervening 30 years looking for information on this castle that was supposed to be here and found almost nothing. There is quite literally a handful of mentions across history of Bransholm Castle. It's an astonishingly ill-documented place. So it still has an air of mystery. We don't even know who lived here in the Tudor age, who built the hall and led it to becoming known as Mansion House. All we do know is that it's here, right now, and it could really do with a proper archaeological survey, because I think it's got a lot of interesting stuff to give up. But in the meantime, Bransholm, You've got your own castle. Enjoy. <laughs>